morning. Hey, I want to welcome you this morning to Harmony Church. We're excited you're with us. I'm Pastor Shane, the student pastor here, and I just want to welcome you again this morning. Uh, if you're new here at Harmony and you haven't done this before, we'd love for you to fill out a connection card. It can be found in your bulletin. Uh, you can fill that out and place it on the table on your way out, and uh, just wait for us to connect with you, get to know you. If you're watching on Facebook Live with us, here in a moment there'll be a link that goes up for an online connection card you can fill out. Uh, if you're watching with us, uh, comment and say hi from where you're watching. Uh, we'd love for you to join in uh, on Facebook Live. Or if you're here in person, I know where you're watching from, here. I'm working towards it, guys. One day, one day, it's going to just, yeah, it, okay. Uh, <laughs> but we want to thank you again for coming. Um, I'm going to pray for us as we get the service started, and then uh, we'll stand together and sing praises to our Lord. So. Uh, dear and Father, Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you that we can uh, gather this morning in your house. Lord, I thank you for your son, Jesus, that we can uh, worship a risen Savior today. Lord, I pray now that this uh, time of worship and opening your word would honor and glorify you. Lord, and we just uh, thank you and praise you. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. All right, as he said, um, y'all go ahead and stand up, and we will sing together. Yeah, that's all I have to say. So, here we go. You in 
the press and healing virtue stole was answered daughter go in peace thy faith has made thee whole like her with hopes and fears we come to touch you if we may oh send us not despairing
your purposes shine through in everything. Because you're bigger than everything else and you're, you're more powerful than everything else and you mean good from everything. God, your, your glory and your holiness and your love shine through in everything around us. And I pray that you would give us eyes to see that more clearly. Um, and let this morning, let the, the sermon, um, let our time of worship together be a means to, to that end. So we give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to be back with you today. Last weekend, uh, I was gone. I was out of town for a wedding uh, up in Connecticut, and um, I got to fly for the first time during this whole craziness. And let me tell you, uh, Connecticut, who's almost back to normal in their state, they're not fond of people from uh, highly infected states like ours coming into their state. I had to jump through some hoops to get in there, but uh, it's good to be back today. And as we start approaching the end of summer and looking ahead to fall, of course, school is going to be starting soon. And um, we're praying for uh, you as parents and students and, and teachers, praying for God's wisdom and God's uh, stamina as school looks a little different this fall. Um, it seems like we're going to get some college football this fall, which uh, is, is a gift from God. I am so happy that live sports are back. Uh, I desperately missed watching live sports during the quarantine, uh, but I'll tell you what kept me going during quarantine without live sports was the Last Dance documentary. Did, did anybody watch that or know what that is? This was the 10 the part uh, ESPN documentary that they did about Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls back in the 90s during their heyday. And I was a huge Jordan fan and a Bulls fan back then. And so every Sunday night we sat down as a family and we watched it and it settled. Uh, well, there was no debate in my mind, but it settled the debate in our house over who is the, the GOAT, the greatest of all time. It is not LeBron James. It is absolutely Michael Jordan. But I remember back in 2007, LeBron James had been in, in the NBA for just a couple of years by then, and people started to realize, wow, this, this guy may be, uh, he may go down as the greatest of all time. I mean, this kid is, is something special. And so in 2007, Nike came out with this big ad campaign about him. And the ad campaign was this, we are all witnesses. Like, we are witnessing something incredible with this kid. Uh, just true basketball and athletic greatness. We're not doing out there, out there doing these incredible athletic feats, but he is, and we're witnesses to it. And I wondered back then if Nike had maybe used the Bible to come up with that ad campaign. Because long before LeBron James, uh, the Bible used that same imagery to talk about us in relation to Jesus Christ. We are all witnesses. Jesus did incredible things through his life and his death and his resurrection. And uh, we are to be witnesses to it. Now normally when you talk about witnessing, if you're a Christian, you've been around church for a while and you're familiar with Christian lingo and you hear that word witness, you start to get a little nervous because witnessing can strike fear in the hearts of even the most outgoing believer. Because when we talk about witnessing, what are we talking about? We're talking about audibly, verbally talking to somebody about, about their eternity. About issues like heaven and hell and sin and trusting in Jesus. And it can be scary, awkward stuff. Well, if, if that strikes fear in your heart today, I have good news for you. There are more ways to be a witness for Jesus Christ than just audibly sharing the gospel. Now, let me just pause right here and say this. You should be sharing the gospel. Okay, you're commanded to. You're given that privilege. It is a privilege. You don't have to be an expert at the Bible. You don't have to be some amazing theologian. Um, but you need to know the basic gospel message, the, the good news of Jesus Christ, the, the basic message of the Christian faith. You need to know that well enough that you could clearly articulate it to people. And we need to be people that are willing to push past the fear and the awkwardness of sharing the gospel and just do it because we believe that eternity is real, right? We believe that, that people's lives are at stake here. So what we're going to talk about today doesn't, uh, doesn't get us off the hook of, of sharing the gospel. But what we're going to see is that there are aspects of our witness. There are ways that we live and carry ourselves that will have an impact on people. 
and eventually afford us the opportunity to be able to share the gospel message with people. We're going to talk about this today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you've got a Bible or a phone or an iPad or you want to follow along, we'll be in 1 Thessalonians 4. And somebody give me a little help here. What is the main theme of this letter of 1 Thessalonians that the Apostle Paul wrote? It's about the what of Jesus. Ouch. Now did nobody say it or am I that deaf? 1 Thessalonians is about the return of Jesus, right? Yes. Okay. Then our next study in a couple of weeks where we study verse by verse through 1 Thessalonians is going to be especially important. We're going to parachute right into the middle of this uh, chat of this book today. And uh, we're going to look at this letter and, and a, a section of the letter where the Apostle Paul talks about uh, their witness to a watching world. You know, there's some passages in the Bible that are they're hard, they're complicated, they're difficult to understand, and it's the burden of preachers like myself and Pastor Shane to figure out what exactly the passage means and then figure out how to present it in a way that's beneficial for, for you. But then there are other passages that are just so simple and so clear that, that the only job of the preacher is to get out of the way of the text, and that's where we're at today. So let me go ahead and read this passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9-12. through 12. This is what the Apostle Paul says. About brotherly love, you don't need me to write to you because you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. In fact, you're doing this toward all the brothers and sisters in the entire region of Macedonia. But we encourage you, brothers and sisters, to do this even more. To seek to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you so that you may behave properly in the presence of outsiders and not be dependent on anyone. Those four verses are just a a little series of exhortations and commands and encouragements from Paul to this church. And at a first reading, it might seem a little disjointed. Almost seems like a, a potpourri list of things that Paul was telling them to do. But if you read it a few more times, you'll see that there's actually a structured flow of thought to Paul's words here. And I think that the end goal of the commands that Paul gives to these people is found in verse 12. Notice what he says again. So that you may behave properly in the presence of outsiders. Now the outsiders that he's speaking to here are non-Christians. They're those that haven't yet trusted in Jesus as their Savior. He says, I want you to live in such a way that people that don't know Jesus will sit up and take notice by the way that you live your life. So let me give you the the big idea of this passage right up front this morning. It's super simple. Living out your faith in practical ways can have a tremendous influence on non-Christians. Paul is explaining to them here that Christianity is a practical faith. It's to make a practical difference in how they live their lives. And when they lived out their faith in Jesus Christ in these everyday practical ways, that was actually a really great way to influence non-Christians for Jesus. The idea here is that people are watching. And we can, by the way we live, we can repel people away from Jesus Christ, or we can draw people to Jesus Christ. I was thinking about that this past week, and I was remembering when Steph was pregnant with, with Judah, with our oldest, and we were trying to figure out what we were going to name this kid. And uh, if, if, if you've been there, if you've had kids, you've got a, a, a list of names that you kind of think about, toss around, and go through. And um, I think first name on the list that we were seriously considering was Noah. We really liked the name Noah. And, uh, man, that was, that was a runner for, uh, for what we were going to name him. And ultimately, we decided not to go with Noah because at that time, Steph worked at a preschool. And the brattiest kid at that preschool was this little dude named Noah. And she said, I cannot think of that kid every time I hold my baby. So, so we, we went with Judah instead. We were repelled by that name because of how somebody else acted. And it's possible for us to do that with the name of Jesus. So if you are scared to death at the thought of going up to somebody and and sharing the gospel with them, this passage should be good news for you. What Paul is going to do here is he's going to talk about three ways to have an abnormal witness. That's the name of the series that we've been in, right? Return to 
abnormal. We're talking about things that when this whole COVID mess is over, we don't want to go back to normal. And one of those things is our witness for Jesus Christ. So Paul's going to talk here about about three ways to practically live out your Christian faith and in doing so, to influence those that don't yet know Jesus. Here's the first way to have an abnormal witness, according to the Apostle Paul. Grow in your love for others. Grow in your love for others. Notice again, verse 9. He says, about brotherly love, you don't need me to write to you because you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. In fact, you're doing this toward all the brothers and sisters in the entire region of Macedonia. But we encourage you, brothers and sisters, to do this even more. Love is a a dominant theme in this letter. Back in chapter 1, verse 3, Paul talks to them about their their labor that was prompted by love. In chapter 3, verse 6, Timothy, who was the pastor of this church, he reminded Paul about their love. He says, but Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your love. Over in chapter 3, verse 12, Paul prays for them to love each other more. He says, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and everyone else. And so he gets here to chapter 4 and he uses this little interesting literary device. He says, listen, when it comes to love, I don't even need to write to you about it. You guys are doing such a phenomenal job when it comes to loving each other. But then what does Paul do? He just goes ahead and gives them some instruction about love anyways. He says, I don't need to, I don't need to say anything to you guys about love, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyways. Now, you ever do that with people? Right? Maybe when your, your kid starts driving, you're like, listen, you're a great driver. I know that. I don't even need to tell you, but, you know, go the speed limit today when you go out. And, you know, and I, I know you, you already know this, but, you know, tonight when you're coming home, it's going to be dark. Make sure you turn your lights on. You're, you're, you're saying, I don't, you're, you're good at this. I don't need to tell you anything about it, but I'm, I'm going to do it anyways. That's what Paul is doing here. And the word that he uses here for love is where we get the English word Philadelphia. It means what? Brotherly love, right? City of brotherly love. And so this particular idea of love was uh, the word that was used in this culture for the love that family members would have for each other. It would rarely be used to describe the love that non-family members had for each other, except almost all the biblical writers did use this word to describe the kind of love that Christians were to have for other Christians. Now why is that? You know why. That's because God looks at Christians as a family. And we're going to see that throughout this letter. Paul addresses these people who had no natural relation to each other as brothers and sisters. 19 different times Paul does it in 1 Thessalonians. And one of the little cultural things that I've I've noticed over the past uh, many years now is that more and more guys will refer to each other as bro, right? You've heard this. What's up, bro? Hey, bro, how's it going? Or or I even, this is my favorite, bruh. Right? Not bro, but bruh. If I had a quarter for every time my boys referred to me as bruh at home. Did you guys take out the garbage? Bruh. And so I, I heard a guy, uh, this was a couple of years ago by now. This was just out in public somewhere. Uh, somebody called him bro, and he said, hey, don't bro me if you don't know me. Okay? I'm not, if we're not friends, if we're not related, like if we're not friendly with each other, don't call me bro. Don't bro me if you don't know me. Well, Christians are to bro each other, right? We're to, we're to refer to each other as, as brothers and sisters because we really are a family. And when Christians live their lives in committed, loving relationships with each other, a watching world sits up and they take notice. How we interact with each other here at church can have a positive effect or a negative effect on those that don't yet know Jesus. Notice what Paul says to him here. He says, you've been taught by God to love each other. What do you think he means by that? That we've been taught by God to love. Well, I think it means that when you become a Christian, God teaches you through a variety of ways to love. And one of the things that he does is he puts you in contact with other Christians and through your involvement in the life of the local church like this one, you learn to love and care for others. And this is what Paul says to this this group of Christians. He says, you've been taught by God to love. I want to encourage you to do it more and more 
and more. And in this context, this demonstration of love that Paul was talking about was probably economic giving. We know from another letter that Paul wrote that there was a group of Christians in Macedonia, which is where, these, uh, where, where Thessalonica was at, that were very financially generous. I think he's talking about these Christians here. And they were quick to express their love to other Christians that were in need by giving financially to them. So friends, what are some ways in our context today that we could grow in our love for each other? How can we express love to each other as a church family in this COVID time period? Well, we could serve each other. right? If, if you have a need, it should be my privilege to come alongside you and, and serve you. If I have a need, you should, you should come alongside me. This is what Christians do. We should look to support each other and help each other. We should be looking for ways to encourage each other. Are you going through something painful right now? How could the rest of us come alongside you and encourage you? We, we could continue to, to be generous in our financial giving. I've been so uh, thankful to God at how our church has, has continued to give. Even during this difficult time, it's been uh, economically challenging for many, many people. You've continued to be faithful. That is great. That's what Paul's talking about here. So think about ways that you can do some of those things this week. How will people know that we're Christians? Is it by our, our protests? Is it by our soapbox issues? Is it by what we're against? No, they'll know that we're Christians by our love. And, and it goes back to that big idea that living out your faith in practical, everyday ways can have a tremendous influence on non-Christians. Second way that we can have an abnormal witness. You ready for this? Mind your own business. Mind your own business. And Paul says that very thing in verse 11. He says to seek to lead a quiet life to mind your own business. Now that's kind of a strange thing to read in the Bible. What does Paul mean here? Well, it might help us a little bit if we understand what the opposite of minding your own business is. How would you define the opposite of that? Well, I think it's to be a busybody. I think it's to be a person that's, that's loud and obnoxious and negative and a, they're a complainer and they meddle in things. This is the type of person that's always involved in controversy. They're always stirring up trouble and trouble and problems and strife just seems to follow people like this. And Paul says, don't be like that. Mind your own business he says make it your ambition to lead a quiet life now understand me here paul is not saying make it your ambition to lead an isolated life now it's 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 not that at all right one of the points of living our lives as christians is to have an impact on non-christians so paul's not calling them or us to to be hermits where we, we band together with our little Christian community away from the big bad world. No, he says, you get out there and you live among people. But don't be out there causing strife. And this doesn't mean that we can't be involved in public affairs or, or politics or positions of leadership where we might be in the limelight. But we have to be so careful about that. Because by its very nature, you might be required to make things besides the gospel the main thing. You know, sometimes as Christians, we, we pride ourselves on being bold and outspoken. And sometimes we take some heat for that, and, and that's okay. But you need to ask yourself the question, am I taking heat because of my stand for God? Or is it simply because I'm abrasive or loud or I'm always meddling in things that I shouldn't be meddling in? And so again, very practically, what are some ways that, that we could mind our own business for the sake of the gospel? Well, don't gossip. Right? Get, get out of situations where you'll be tempted to gossip or where other people will be gossiping. Be careful about your soapbox issues. Make sure that you're known first and foremost for your love for God. Uh, be careful about what you post on social media. Are you known as, as the person on Facebook or other social media uh, platforms that's, that's about uh, this soapbox issue? Be careful about things like that so paul tells these people to grow in their love for each other to mind their own business and then thirdly to simply work hard 
to be hard workers. And we see that at the end of verse 11. He says, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. So the obvious application here is that if you are working a desk job, you need to quit that and go get a job that puts you outside, right? No, that's not what he's saying. That phrase, work with your hands, the emphasis there is on the work not necessarily with your hands. You don't need to quit your job and become a a contractor or whatever. Work with your hands simply means work. So you need to stop being a busybody. You need to mind your own business and work hard. And why is that? Well, look at what he says at the very end of verse 12. He says, and not be dependent on anyone. Now, in this ancient world, there was a social institution that was made up of two different classes of people. There was the upper class called the patrons, and then there was the the middle or the lower class called the clients. And the patrons had very high positions of honor and influence, and what they would do is they would buy off the clients. The clients would conduct their public life in a way that was advantageous to the patrons. It's a lot like politicians uh, uh, buying off people today so that they can win influence or get voted into office. I think Paul was probably addressing that here. People in this church, more than likely, were the clients. And it's possible that many of them were receiving dirty money from the patrons. But that meant that the patrons could dictate how the clients lived and acted and made decisions. And of course, in a setup like that, it would be really easy for the gospel to be compromised. And so Paul says, you need to get out of that situation. You don't need to depend on them for your livelihood. You get out there and work hard yourself. Now, of course, in our social situation here, we're a little bit different, but the main principle remains. Are you working hard in the position that God has put you in? Does your work ethic point people to the fact that you're different than everybody else? Have you ever thought that by the way you work, that you could either lead people to Jesus... Or lead people away from Jesus? Does the way that you interact with people at work, does it let them know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? Do you complain about your boss? Do you you complain or put down your your co-workers? Students, how, how would this apply to you? How could you work hard in school? How could you have an influence on people at school and point them to Jesus? What would that look like for you in the classroom or on the athletic field? For those of you that are working in the home or are retired, what does this look like for you? How could you help and serve others and in doing so to have an influence on them? You may not feel like you could ever go up to somebody and engage them in a conversation about Jesus or the gospel. And, And if you feel that way, we would love to come alongside you and help you to be more comfortable in sharing the gospel. But put that aside for now. Paul tells us here that just living out your faith in everyday practical ways, it can have a tremendous influence on non-Christians. This is something that every single one of us could do, no matter what stage of life we're in. So, I want to ask two questions about this by way of application. Two questions for us to to kind of chew on and think about this week. The first question is this, am I living unselfishly? Am I living unselfishly? Paul's given us three practical ways to live out our faith. And what do all three of those things have in common? They require selflessness. All three of these things require you to live in an unselfish way. So, are you living unselfishly? Or is there just a great preoccupation with yourself in your life? I think a lot of people buy into this idea that the way to really be free in your life is to not have any sort of obligation to other people. That freedom is found, they think, in just living for yourself and focusing on you. Hey, as followers of Jesus, we know that's not true, right? We know that freedom doesn't come from living for ourselves and and being free from obligations from God or others. It's just the opposite. Freedom comes when we give ourselves and we spend ourselves for the Lord and for other people. And so is there an unselfishness to your life? Is there an others first focus to your life? And then the second question is this, am I growing? Am I growing in these things? You you may not be perfect at the things that we've talked about this morning, but are you doing a better job of it than you were three years ago? 
or six months ago? Are you progressing and growing in these things? That's what the Apostle Paul says to these Thessalonians. He says, you're doing a great job of loving each other. Let me encourage you to do it more and more. He says there's room for growth. And, and friends, it's, it's true for us as well. That more and more should be evident in our lives. Now, who's the perfect example of everything that we've talked about this morning? You know. It's Jesus, right? Nobody did a better job of drawing people to God by the simple, faithful life of integrity than Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus preached, right? He taught about God, but by the way he lived his life and the way that he carried himself, he just drew people to the Lord. Scripture tells us that Jesus was a friend of sinners. So people that wouldn't normally darken the door of a church, they were drawn to Jesus. They flocked to Jesus because there was something about him and there was something about the way that he carried himself. He had a tremendous impact on people that didn't believe. And so he's our example for this. But even more importantly than our example, he's our sacrifice. Jesus lived out these practical, God-honoring ways to influence unbelievers and he did it perfectly. And think about this. Where you failed at this, where I've failed at this, Jesus did it perfectly. And here's the good news of the gospel. When we trust in him, when we give our lives to him, his perfect record of obedience is given to us. It, it truly is good news. And so what that should do is it should motivate us and, and free us to live in this unselfish way where our goal is to not just live for ourselves, but to, to live our lives trying to influence people that don't yet know Christ. And so every single one of us has a choice this week. We can live with a, a self-focused way, or we can live in an other-focused way. And my prayer is that we would live out our, our faith in such a practical, normal, everyday way this week that, that people that don't know Jesus in the way that you know Jesus, that are, that's in your sphere of influence, that they would sit up and they would take notice and they would say, that person is different. I wonder what they have that I don't have. I wonder what makes them the way they are, because I don't have that in my life. That's a privilege that God has given us, and it's a responsibility, and it's my prayer that this week that we would live that way. So Father, we come to you now and... God, we understand that we are your witnesses. And Father, we, we admit, we confess that we have failed to, to be your witnesses perfectly, Lord. We have sometimes done a really poor job of this. And that's where we're so thankful and grateful for what Jesus has done, that, that he uh, did that perfectly for us. And so, Father, I pray that we would look to him, and I pray that we would... Um, look to the power of the Holy Spirit that resides within us to, to live in the ways that we've been called to live. It's easy to talk about this on Sunday right now, Lord, but man, when life hits us tomorrow morning and we're at work and, and things go south, it's a little harder to keep that witness for you. Father, show us how important this is. And when we fail and we mess up, which we will, Lord, give us the strength, give us the humility to own up and to fess up and to, to apologize where needed. God, we want to be your witnesses. We know, Lord, that there are countless people around the globe that, that don't know you yet. We know that there are countless people right here in Sumter County that don't know Jesus yet. Maybe they know about him, but they haven't placed their faith in him. God, we would love for, for Harmony Church to be able to have an impact on those people. We would love, Lord, by the way that we live and, and share to see people cross over that line of faith for the very first time. So God, may it be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all stand again with us, please.
seat for just one more minute. Just uh, two things by way of announcement before we take off this morning. We've been letting you know that uh, on Wednesday, August 26, we are going to have a end of Bible Alive celebration slash Kid Zone kickoff. And uh, we're excited about that. We're going to be uh, cautious and careful in how we do that, but we want to celebrate all that the Lord did in this uh, very unique way of doing Bible Alive this year, and then also give you some information and uh, sort of kick off our, our Kid Zone uh, with the bang. Kid Zone is happening this fall. This is our uh, Wednesday night kids ministry. And uh, the first night is going to be Wednesday, September 9th. So if you have kids that are, what, I think three years old up until fifth grade, we would love to, to get them plugged in and, and uh, teach them uh, the good news of the gospel in a, in a fun, creative way. So Wednesday, September 9th is when that's going to start. Now, uh, one little bit of a bummer today is that we have to say goodbye to somebody today. And uh, that is Rachel Knauer has served as our uh, summer student ministry intern. And Rachel, we just want to let you know how grateful and thankful we are for you. You've absolutely crushed it this summer. And you came in uh, during a time of transition and totally kept things uh, together and you had to be super creative because global pandemic, all that. You should get like college credit for that. 
But uh, we thank you so much. And uh, yeah, if I need to write a letter to somebody, I can do that. Rachel's uh, last night with the students was two weeks ago, but I think you're heading back to school, right? And uh, so we're praying for you. We're praying for a great semester. And thank you. Uh, You have served our church very, very well. Can we stand to be dismissed with a benediction? And I always say this, but a benediction is a good word. And uh, we need to leave today with a good word from God from the New Testament letter of Jude. Here are these encouraging words. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. And everybody said together, Amen.